we may encounter many defeats, but we must not be defeated. Maya Angelou. Welcome back, podcast listeners. It's another Monday, and which means we have in store for you another fantastic episode. We have joining us today, Jose Luis Alfaro. Now, Jose is a human trafficking survivor, a public speaker, author, advocate, activist. He is a proud member of the LGBTQ plus community. And today we really get to dive into not just sex trafficking or his experience, but we really get into, you know, sexual identity as well as family legacy. And of course, our favorite part, those actionable steps that we can all take towards expanding our own universe, our own realities. And, um, you know, listening back on this episode, I just have to take a moment to say, I am once again struck by how human trafficking, uh, sex trafficking in particular, it is not a causality, but is rather it is the symptom of a much larger collective issue. It's it's a collection of issues, uh, you know, and so when, when I say that, what I mean is that when we look back and we look at the causalities of how we got to where we were, um, things such as intergenerational trauma, epigenetics, patriarchy, misogyny, uh, shame, fear, poverty, intolerance, uh, childhood behavioral conditioning, laws that dehumanize us, religions that denounce us. Um, you know, we look back upon our histories that have holes in them, places where we haven't been given the full story. And so without that full story, without that wisdom and that knowledge, we continue to engage in reactive actions that are, you know, just a repetition of histories long since past. And uh, never, never more has it been important for listeners such as yourself who are getting curious, who are asking those important questions, who are engaging with the world around them and who are looking to expand their reality. It's never been more important uh, of a time. And so I want to just say thank you. I, it can't be said enough. Thank you for taking the time to honor not just our guests, but also your own legacy. And um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. <laughs> I just wanted to take a minute to say that, to say thank you uh, for sharing uh, the episodes that touch you and for leaving reviews. Those are those keep us going. Thank you. And uh, if the music, I mean, how could you not? But if the music in particular, our intro and our outro has been uh, hitting home for you, if you find yourself bebopping along to that intro outro, that music is by fellow Hollow. Fellow Hollow is one of my favorite bands and Counting Deer, their third single from the new album, Violet Paper Wings, which is dropping in December, Counting Deer is now streaming everywhere. So if you haven't already uh, been listening to them, I want you to head to your favorite music platform and I want you to hit that stream button, hit that download button and get ready because they're whole catalog is delicious. It is transformational music. And um, so here we go. We're going to hit that play. You're going to get to enjoy some fellow hollow. And then we're going to get down and dirty with Jose Luis Alfaro. Welcome to the podcast, Jose. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're just delighted that you're willing to be here and share your story with us. It's, it's You have an incredible story, which I found out about um, because you did a webinar speaker series, I believe, with Youth Underground through our mutual friend, Rasha Hamad. 
Yes. Yes. That was, that was a great experience. I loved the way they shared my story. It was completely open, no editing. It was pretty awesome. I'm such a big fan of Youth Underground because, you know, much like the podcast we're doing today, it's about giving, um, you know, just the voices that you wouldn't normally get the opportunity to hear from a platform to speak their truth and to not be edited and you know, to not have to be politically correct, but just really speak from the heart. So it was, it was incredible. Your story was magnificent. Absolutely. I love that, to be honest with you. I think it's important that we hear um, people's stories um, without being edited. I feel like as a gay male, um, also a Latino, I feel like a lot of people want me to kind of change my story or edit my story so that it fits um, a certain platform. But for me, I think it's so important to tell it like it is so that if there's anyone out there who's been through something similar, um, hopefully it, it'll be able to help them a lot more. Absolutely. And that's something I really do want to get into. Um, I can, you know, I'm just going to be blunt and honest. I don't know much about um, the scene that's going on. Uh, LGBT. TQ plus plus yes okay <laughs> the plus the plus is just so you don't have to name the IA et cetera et cetera you know because oh, okay going. gotcha yeah. um yeah and, and you know just I'm hoping that you will share as much as you can about that journey that you have been taking to be open and free and to live your truth uh within your own defined set of rules so you are currently, where, where are we talking to you from today? You're currently uh, in Boston, is that right? Yes, I live in Boston, Massachusetts, and I've been here for, I believe, eight years now, since 2012. How did you end up in Boston? Because I believe you were from Texas originally. Yes, I am from Texas originally, um, and the trafficking situation happened within Texas, um, and the way that I got, and I say got out of Texas, and the reason why is it's a very conservative state for those who don't know. Um, it was very hard for me to grow up in such a conservative state. Um, so I always knew that I wanted to move somewhere different, somewhere where people were more accepting. And to be honest with you, my goal was to move towards New York City. Mm -hmm. um, but I ended up on a completely different path in my life after everything that I've gone through. And I came into a different world. And that world is the sugar daddy, the um, prostitution, the, what are other terms for it? The survival sex um, world, basically. And I ended up coming in contact with a gentleman who offered me a place to stay rent free with food um to come and move and live with him in boston massachusetts and that's honestly how i came to boston um did you find um did you find the relationship on a website i did find the relationship on a website it was <laughs> It's kind of funny to me now talking about it, but it was a website called houseboy.com. Mm -hmm. um, I don't re recommend anyone to go on this path. It's very dangerous. It's very scary. Um, but again, I was at a point in my life where I felt like I had no more options. I felt like I had no one to turn to. I didn't have support. And I was finding the support um, from older men online. Um, and thank God that I found someone that was actually a decent human being, um, mm -hmm. who was actually looking for a companion. And he offered me a place, like I said, rent free with food on the table. And he comes to me and says under one condition. And I can't, I can't even explain to you what I was feeling when he said under one condition, cause I'm thinking, Oh, here we go. This guy's going to mm -hmm. want, some form of sexual gratification. I don't, I don't even know what it was that I thought he was going to ask me, but he turned around and said, you have to go back to school if you plan on living here. And wow. that for me, honestly, took me back onto a better journey for myself to better myself. 
Um, and I went to beauty school and I became a hairstylist. So that's so amazing. What, you know, just what are the chances of meeting somebody that are, that was, had your best interest at heart, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's rare, to be honest with you. It's very rare, especially in that setting, right? It is very rare. And that's why I was so shocked that he didn't make it sexual or make it about something to please him in some sort of way. And instead it was for myself, to support myself. And he said to me, he said, you're a great person. You're an awesome awesome guy. He was like, and we both discussed that our relationship wasn't becoming anything more than a friendship. Mm -hmm. And, and that's all it was between the two of us. So I was greatly shocked that he was offering me this deal basically. Um, and it, it changed my life to be honest with you. I, um, I'm so happy that you were, you know, that you met somebody that actually was very much in line with your own intentions to better yourself. You know, like you brought that person into your life and that you were able to uh, move up to Boston. That's incredible. I will tell you this on that topic of wanting to better myself. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I was in a place in my life to where I no longer wanted I no longer had goals. I no longer had respect for myself. I no longer wanted to go back to school. I no longer had that drive in me. Mm. And I found it pretty hard to come to terms with the idea that this was something that I was going to end up doing, to be honest with you. Um, Like I said, after going through what I had gone through, mentally, it just beats you down and weighs down on you. But again, I'm so happy that he did um, suggest that I go back to school because like I said, it has changed my life and it's taking me on a similar journey that I was on before everything happened to me. Well, let's jump into that. Let's jump into the before and then, and then we'll kind of roll back into what's going on with you now. But can you take us back to before, you know, what was your life like growing up? You know, what was taking place that um, pushed you in the directions of survival uh, and, and sex work? So I, like I said, I grew up in a very small conservative town in Texas. It's called Navasota, Texas. Um, very, very small town in the middle of nowhere. Um, the closest city is Houston, Texas, which is about two hours away. Um, and growing up, I was very feminine. Um, I considered myself different. I didn't really understand sexuality. I didn't know who I was. I don't think anyone really knows who they are when they're a young child. Um, I also grew up in the church, um, Southern Baptist, um, and then non-denominational church, um, And I had a lot of faith. I believed in God. I believed in religion. And to be honest with you, when I started to come into terms with my sexuality or not even coming into terms, just trying to figure out who I, who I was. um, And I realized that sexually I was attracted to men. I struggled tremendously and I feared three things. I feared being rejected from my parents. I Mm. feared what my friends were going to think of me. And I also most of all feared, um, going to hell. And that was something that I struggled with for a very, very long time. And I remember asking God, you know, God, please, please, please help me change, fix me. Um, because I no longer want to be this person that everyone hates. And that was, like I said, a very, very hard struggle for me. Um, When I was coming into terms with my sexuality and figuring out who I was, I was quote unquote, and I put this in quotations because at the time I still wasn't comfortable saying it was a boyfriend, Um, but it was technically a relationship. And I was seeing a guy who was in college. I was 15 years old. Um, and it was my first sexual experience and I was starting to have strong feelings for him. 
Um, I think my parents started to realize that I was becoming a little more absent, um, especially at dinner and during family functions. Um, so I think they took it upon themselves to go through my phone one day while I was showering. And when they went through my phone, they found the text messages between me and that college guy. And my father um, ended up backhanding me in the, on the side of my face. I blacked out. Cops were called. It was a big ordeal. Um, and long story short, my father questioned me and he said, how are we going to fix you? And how are we going to change you? And I, like I said, with the feelings that I had of fearing God and going to hell, fearing my, the rejection of my parents and my friends, I wanted to change as well. And I had already thought about this. And I said to him, I said, move me somewhere new, somewhere far away where I can start all over and I will change. Wow. Um, so I moved, they moved me to San Antonio, Texas, which was about four hours away. It was a much larger city than what I grew up in. Um, and from there I ended up meeting a 36 year old man. Um, his name was Cody and he began sexually abusing me. I would see him every, uh, every weekend we would hang out and we would have sex basically. I was 16 years old at the time. Um, and I began having feelings for him. You know, he began saying things to me, like when you're 18 years old, you can move in with me when you go to college and a nearby university. Um, and he had this whole world and future planned for me. Um, and I started to dream and imagine these things that he was saying to me to become true. Um, so I began seeing this older guy and then I went back home after the semester was over and my father questioned me again. And he said, it worked. You've changed, right? And I remember hearing Cody's voice in the back of my head telling me, you know, having these discussions about um, conversion therapy, about religion, about how normal it is to be gay and how there's no way that you can change and this is who you are and you just have to accept it. And he was definitely right. Um, he just wasn't right for the sexual abuse that I was enduring at the time. Um, but I remembered what he was saying to me and I looked at my father and I said, no, there's no way that I'm ever going to change. This is who I am and you have to accept it. And my father looked at me and he began to cry and then he got angry and he said, I can no longer have you living in the same house as me if this is what you've decided. And at that time, he had given me an ultimatum and he said, either you're going to go to church, you're going to go to therapy over the summer, you're going to go to a conversion therapy camp. He goes, and if you choose not to do this, then you need to leave my house. And it was in that moment that I decided that I was going to leave. And I called Cody and I asked him to come and pick me up. And we looked into, we called a lawyer and we figured out a way that I could move in with him and it be legal. Um, um, so then from there, I'm now living a life on my own at 16. Um, I have no car, no phone. I had to get a job and still focus on school, high school. And it was hard. It was really, really, really hard um, to not have the support from your family, um, which is needed um, for any 16-year-old, 17-year-old growing up. Um, and also still enduring the abuse from Cody, we would, he would have sex with me four or five times a day, even at times when I would say, no, I don't want to, um, because I was in so much pain already. Um, but it was something that I felt I had to do because here I have this man helping me, um, survive and taking care of me. And, 
it wasn't until I realized that he had a sex addiction and he was also sleeping with other people while he was sleeping with me four or five times a day. Um, so I left him, went back home. And again, my father begins to fight with me. Um, so he chases me out of the house. And from there, I go to a friend's house and I come in contact with Jason Gandy, um, who is also known as the guy who trafficked me. Mm. Um, from there, um, I go online to a website called gay.com and I was just looking to chat with people. Um, at the time I was at a girlfriend's house and she was telling me that I could stay for the night. But after that one night, she felt like her father probably wasn't going to like the idea of me staying in the same house as her, which I totally understood. And I told her not to worry about it, that I would figure things out. And, um, that's when I came in contact with Jason Gandy. Um, he began to empathize with me, um, telling me that he felt sorry for me and for what I was going through. He said he had similar friends who had gone through similar situations and that he wanted to help me. He told me he had a nine bedroom home in Austin, Texas, that he was in business in Houston at the moment and that he was close by. If I needed, he could come and pick me up. Um, he also offered to put me in private school, which was at the time school was such a huge priority of mine. Um, so he painted this picture of a world and a dream. Uh, you know, it was, it was like a perfect world for me, you know, private school, um, a nine bedroom home. It sounded like a mansion, this life of luxury. I, couldn't help but say yes, especially when I had no one else to turn to or any other options. So I told him yes, and he came to pick me up in Navasota, Texas, and drove me to Houston. Um, from there, um, he began massaging me. Um, he also introduced me to a world of health and fitness. Um, and then he brought up the idea that it would be good for me to um, begin making money on my own so that I can save up and have a future and provide for myself. And it's in this moment um, where he introduces the idea of working with him and providing massages with him in his massage business. Um, this is where, this is basically how he set up or set me up to introduce me into a world of human trafficking. Um, he told me that I would make at least 40 bucks a massage. Um, and I'm sitting here thinking, okay, this will be easy. I can give a massage, no big deal, until I walk into the room and there's a fully grown man, completely naked, face down on a massage table. And as we walk in, Jason begins to take off his clothing and he looks at me. And it's in that moment that I remembered, he told me, it's going to be easy, just do as I do. And I remembered that and I look at him and he looks at me and he just shakes his head up and down and says, yes. And I knew in this moment, I know what's going to happen. This is going to be sexual. So I began to take my clothing off my shorts, my underwear, and we began giving the massage and very quickly it began to become sexual. Um, and from then on, the massages were all sexual. It was anywhere from oral sex, um, touching, grabbing, masturbation. Um, and I started to, I hate to say it this way, but I started to get used to it mm -hmm. and I started to become comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And I felt like there was no other option for me, that this was the only way for me to survive and to continue living, basically. Um, There were a few questions that I had. If I say, no, I don't want to do this, who's going to stop me? Is, Is Jason going to harm me in some kind of way? Is he going to tie me down fearing that I'm going to go to law enforcement? Is this guy laying face down on the bed going to fear that I'm going to go and tell law enforcement and then his family's going to know, his wife's going to know, his employer is going to know that one, he's gay and two, he's receiving massages from an underage boy And is he going to stop me? Is he going to threaten to kill me or hurt me in some form? Um, A lot of these thoughts ran through my head and they kept me from asking them. And instead, I stayed silent and did what I was told. Yeah, makes absolute sense to me. It was, you know, and it's also... I know we were discussing this earlier, um, how whenever you went through what you've gone through, the trafficking at the time, for a long time, you didn't even realize that you had been trafficked. It was the same for me. I didn't know what trafficking was. Um, We see it in the movies like Taken, where we sit there and we think, If it's not exactly like the movie Taken, someone's not tying you down and drugging you, then you're not being trafficked. But there are so many different forms of trafficking. I might not have been tied down physically, but I was tied down mentally to where I felt like I didn't have a voice and I couldn't say yes or no to the things that I was being told to do with fear that I was going to be hurt. I think that that's honestly the most insidious form of trafficking is um, it's the mental abuse side of it. And I know that there's been, there's been scientific tests done that prove that emotional distress and emotional pain actually registers in the same area of the brain as physical pain does. And I mean, I can only speak for myself, but in all honesty, a lot of what you're saying, it just speaks right to my heart because I experienced similar situation, you know, I had left home. Uh, my home life was undesirable for me at the time. And and I met a group of kids and they offered to take me in. Through then, um, I became desensitized. You know, would I have chosen to have sex with people on my own? I can honestly say no. I can honestly say no to that. You know, however, the grooming process, it takes it just twists everything inside out. You become desensitized to nudity. You become desensitized to people touching you because everything just becomes familiar, you know? And also you want to please the people who are in your eyes, taking care of you and saving your life. And then you have this added fear. I I, I don't know about you, but I was afraid of the police. I mean, they did, they did a heck of a good job installing that fear into me. And then you wonder, well, because I'm doing this thing and and it is illegal am I going to get in trouble now because I'm a part of this? And so it, it really makes it hard to step forward. And then you have to take into consideration too, what kind of food are they feeding you? That's giving you that mental brain fog. Are you, you know, the P you are the, you become most like the five people you keep around you. And so when you're surrounded in that toxic negative energy, you start to reflect your environment outwards and inwards, you know, and you begin to merge with it and become a part of it, like that beehive mentality, I feel. Um, And so it makes it really hard to find your own voice, even if you don't like what you're doing, even if you've had a really terrible night, a really bad encounter, you also learn, I think, with the the way that people survive, um, you know, you learn to make concessions, you learn to say, well, that was a bad night. And then you find something happy or good or, you know, joyful to put your efforts and energy into. And you cling to that because that's what does keep you alive. Absolutely. I had those feelings of fear, um, coming from the fact that I didn't realize that 
what Jason was doing to me was wrong. I felt like what I was doing right. was wrong. Yes. I felt like I made the decision to yeah. do this. I felt like if I go to the, and even if I do go to the police and I do get out of this situation, am I going to be the one who ends up in trouble because I made the decision and I said, okay, or I agreed to do it and I went through with it. And Mm -hmm. there was a lot of that fear for a very long time. But not only that, um, when I was dating Cody, the 36 year old, I had many moments where the police were called through arguments that we were having where neighbors were like, you know, there was a disturbance of sound of noise. We were arguing and screaming at each other and the police showed up and the police never ID'd me. The police never questioned me. The police never wanted to find out if I was okay or not. Instead, Mm -hmm. they allowed my abuser to speak for himself and describe what was happening, um, where if they had just asked me, I would have told them the truth and they would have looked into my situation and hopefully they would have helped me. But you also have to remember, we're adding another factor to it, my sexuality, the color of my skin. These are all insecurities of my own to where I fear if they know that I'm gay, are they going to harm me now? Are they going to look the other way and not care about me? Um, Where there were plenty of situations where the police or law enforcement looked the other way because of my sexuality. Mm -hmm. Um, One example would be the night that my father read my text messages and backhanded me and hit me in the face. The police gave me the option to send my father to jail, but persuaded me to not send him to jail, but instead for myself to leave the house, almost as if like it was my fault. And it's those moments where I began thinking the police are not on my side. They're not here to help me. If anything, I'm going to end up in trouble. So then you flash forward to the situation with Jason. Of course, I feared going to the police because they're going to, I felt like they were going to find any excuse any excuse. And the number one excuse would be my sexuality to not pursue anything against, um, my abusers. Mm -hmm. No, I completely relate with that. Um, you know, I was picked up by the cops. I had gotten caught in between two different gangs and, uh, I was unaligned because I was not, I'd gotten out. I'd actually escaped one of my traffickers. And then I got caught between these two and I got beat up really bad. I mean, you know, um, they broke my nose. They dislocated my arm, dragging me out from a car. They were forcing me back into the life. And I kid you not, it was two days later, they throw me back out on the streets. My face is all beat up and I'm skin and bones at this point, you know, because of the, the stress from the lifestyle. And the cops picked me up. I hadn't actually been doing anything wrong. This is interesting. I had not actually been soliciting anybody for sex. They just picked me up based off of what I looked like. And they booked me for it. And they're like, well, we think you're a prostitute and blah, blah, blah. So they threw me in a cell. And instead of charging me with anything, uh, what they did is they actually just drove me back off into the night and dumped me back out on the streets. Nobody asked me you know, Hey, you're pretty beat up. No one said, can we help you? You know, it was, we're going to arrest you and throw you in a cell and, Oh, well, we can't charge you because you weren't actually soliciting a person. We just picked you up because you look beat up. And now we're going to throw you back out onto the streets for your pimp, for your trafficker. There was no question about helping me. So, I mean, that kind of fear that gets instilled in you when you've had police come, I mean, I can only imagine what you must have felt when you encountered this with your parents. And then again, it was reinforced with your lover of the 36-year-old. And then the idea of going to cops when you become very mentally aware that you are not in a situation that you want to be in, you know, that that must have been devastating to know to know that you don't have anywhere to turn. Absolutely. I definitely felt like I didn't have anywhere to turn, but I also felt like 
I also, because I had nowhere to turn, I didn't have the idea that I could go to law enforcement and they were going to help me. But because of that, Mm -hmm. I began to normalize everything that I was going through. This is okay. This is what I have to do. This is what, this is normal. You know, Jason's telling me that this is normal, that this is okay. He's an adult. He knows. And I begin thinking, okay, this is, this is normal. This is okay. And I will say that it was from that moment on that I began to normalize selling my body, um, and allowing people to view me as a sexual object. And that to today mentally has been a struggle and has been affecting me because I was going to, Sorry, I didn't mean I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to ask a, a question, which is, do you think that the way that you were raised um, really contributed to the fact that you made, did you think that that this was all you deserved? Did you think that you weren't worth anything more? You know, how did how did your upbringing and the way that you were treated by your family? How much of a role did that play in allowing other people to exploit you? Do you think? That is a great question because I'm actually writing my memoir currently and my childhood has impacted every single step of my life, Mm -hmm. Um, especially when I met Cody. You know, how is it that at at the age of 16, I was okay with a grown man sexually abusing me? Mm -hmm. Um, I have come to terms with what I had gone through as a child. And also there were a lot of memories that began to come back up that I had forgotten about. Um, And one of those being at a very young age, my parents, because they worked so hard and they were constantly working, they would leave us with my aunt. And when they would leave us with my aunt, there were other kids that were staying there and one being a teenage male. And at the age of like three or four, I was being sexually abused by a teenage guy or boy that was staying with my aunt. And, you know, looking back, I constantly was sexualizing everything. Even though I didn't truly know what sex was, there was this feeling of the sexual urgency that where I constantly was thinking about sex and, I think about that and because of what I had gone through at such a young age and then flash forward to the situation with the 36 year old, I now think this is okay. This is normal. This is what I've done this before. Um, Not only that, um, taking the abuse from my father, my father was physically abusive, physically controlling a narcissist, Um, everything, it was almost like as if he lived in his palace and he was a king of his palace and, and we were his servants, his kids were his servants, his wife was his servant. And if you didn't obey and do as you were told, then you were abused. And that's how I grew up. If, if I did, if my mom didn't have dinner placed on the table and ready for my father when he got home, then she was either going to get a verbal abuse or get verbally abused or physically abused. Um, If my room wasn't cleaned immaculate to where there was no dust to be found anywhere in the room, I would get punished. If I moved a certain way, if I showed that I was feminine or upset, I would get physically abused. Um, and so now I'm thinking in my head, men and the, the, the men that we love and cherish, we need to treat them like Kings. And so being in a relationship with this 36 year old, I'm mentally thinking I have to do anything and everything that he asked me because I now live in his kingdom. You know, I have to respect him and he's offering me a place to stay, I have to be whatever he wants me to be. 
Um, so my childhood has impacted every single thing that I've gone through. And I sit here today and I still question how much of that am I still allowing to impact my daily life? Um, which is again, a struggle, but I'm definitely working on that to make sure that I'm not allowing what I've gone through as a kid or as a teenager to impact my life now. Do you think that it was religion, solely religion that, um, gave your father the, this attachment, this identity of being a king and a ruler in his own household? Or do you think that he had his own family trauma that he had dealt with that he might've suppressed and then been, you know, part of the perpetual cycle of passing it down to you? You know, I've questioned this. I will say, I don't think it's religion. Here's the thing. My father wasn't religious. My mother was religious. My mother, my mother went to religion seeking guidance and seeking help. And my, mind you, these are my own words. So I don't want anyone to think that this is coming from my mother. Um, Mm -hmm. But I believe that my mother went looking for guidance um, and looking for some form of direction on where to go, what to do, how to handle the abuse that she was going through. Therefore, she found God, which I'm so happy she did, but she interpreted the word of God to fit her, her environment. Yeah. Um, and she, as the years continued and progressed, yes, she did even mention at times, she said, I will always put my husband before my children because my husband is the ruler of our house, of our home. And I'll never forget that feeling and thinking that I am always going to be less than my father. And and also taking into consideration that I felt that my father was like a horrible human being. Mm -hmm. Um, because I witnessed the things that he did, you know, I was a victim to him. Um, but I just remember that feeling like my mother is so brainwashed and so warped and believing this bull crap and thinking that this is okay. You know, who, who do I have as a mother to protect me if this is what she believes? Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as my father's upbringing, to be honest with you, from what I've heard from other people, I don't think my father had an abusive childhood, but again, I can't speak for him. Um, but I don't believe that it was his childhood or upbringing that made him that way. No, that makes that absolutely. I mean, everything, you know, everything that you witnessed, um, helps to create, you know, or to, it, it it contributes to forming your opinion, you know, and, how you live out your own life and how you build your own reality around you. And and, um, it's unfortunate. Like it, I think it's, I think it's unfortunate that parents don't share as much with their children as what would be helpful to be honest with you. I mean, I know I have friends of my own that that I love dearly and I always hear them saying, you know, Oh, I'm never going to tell my kids about these things. And Oh, my kids will never know the things that I got up to. And Holy, I really pray that they don't end up like I did. And I think it's so important to tell our kids that they can learn from our lessons, that we can be open. And it sounds like, um, like my family was, it sounds like your family was similar in the sense that they kept these things from you. And it was a do as I say, not as I do situation. Um, which just, is heartbreaking in a lot of ways that you didn't get to know the best sides of your parents and you only, you know, you only knew the rigid structure and the abusive side of that all. Did you ever have good moments with your family? Do you remember like with your brothers and sisters, were there moments that brought you joy or that you ever felt close to them? You know, I'm happy you brought that up because I was just about to bring that up because I don't want people to think that my life was, I mean, a majority of my life was a struggle and was constantly abused. Um, But there were great moments, you know, Mm -hmm. we lived, 
like I said, in the middle of nowhere in the countryside. And I just remember growing up and feeling so free. Um, me and my sisters, we had a great bond. We were so close. Um, you know, there are moments that my father and my mother and we would all have dinner together and like a normal family and we would all laugh and have a great time. But I will say the, the abusive side of things impacted me so much more than those positive moments. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that, well, in other words, they outweighed the good, basically. The bad Mm -hmm. outweighed the good. And I think that's why I very rarely speak of the good times because there were very few, very, Mm -hmm. very few. Um, But yes, I did have good moments in my life. But I think that what made it so bad for me for so long was the fight with my sexual identity Mm -hmm. and trying to figure out who I was to where I constantly could not enjoy being myself because I was constantly told, boys don't do this. Boys don't do that. Boys don't play with Barbies. Boys don't, you know, shake their head back and forth or sing feminine songs or act feminine. And that kept me from enjoying my life as a child. And I constantly was anxious thinking, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong now? I had to correct myself over and over and over again. And it just made my childhood miserable, basically. What was it, what was it like the first time that you kissed another boy? Was there was it shaded by apprehension and fear that someone would find out? Or were you able to fully experience and be in the moment and enjoy that? Um, it took, I'll tell you this, you know, when you get really cold mm-hmm. and you begin to shiver and you mm-hmm. cannot control the shivers until you're warm, uh-huh. that's how it felt the first time I kissed a boy. And I remember this feeling like I was such a horrible person after the fact that I did it. And I remember thinking, you're going to hell. You're a horrible person. This is so bad. And you need to repent for what you've just done. And I did. I cried. I went home. I cried. And I, like I said, I prayed to God, God please forgive me. I'm so sorry. Please change me. This is not who I want to be. And I know I'm not the person that you want me to be, but help me see the person that I, that I need to be. And it was constantly a fear that people were going to find out that people were going to see that people were going to notice. But also I was constantly picked on growing up, you know, for being feminine. You know, Mm -hmm. I have my father correcting me. I have these boys at school telling me that I'm gay, that I'm a fag, that I'm queer, you know, that I'm a girl, um, or trans people even call me trans and I'm not transsexual. I have no, um, feelings of wanting to be a female, Um, But because of my femininity, I was shamed and made fun of constantly. So, of course, I definitely feared um, that what I was doing was wrong. And that's how I felt for a very long time. That's, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'm so, I don't want to say I'm sorry that you went through that because I believe that everybody's experience leads them, you know, to be who they need to become. But my heart is just, it aches for you that you went through that alone and that you didn't have, um, support during that time that, that would have, you know, made it more bearable for you. You know, thank you for that. Um, first of all, but I want you to know that this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is why I'm sharing my story, even though not every gay person goes through what I went through there might be one gay boy who's gone through one situation that is similar to what I've gone through. And if that's going to help them realize that they're not the only one and that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, I want to be that voice and I want to help as many people as I can. Um, But also we live in a time now that where times are changing, it's taken a very long time and it's still, we still have a long way to go. 
but I see a future to where more people are going to begin speaking out um, and helping each other. And hopefully we can come to a day that we realize that we are all human and we should respect each other and love each other and help each other. Um, But hopefully we can all get there. But I think it takes everyone to do their part. And so I'm trying my hardest to do my part and share my experiences and be completely transparent so that I can help whichever young gay boy or girl out there and hopefully give them some form of hope if they're going through what I went through. Mm. What's, um, no, and, and I think that that's admirable. That's exactly why I asked you to, you know, come speak on the podcast. What's your relationship like with religion and or spirituality now after your experiences? Um, <laughs> spirituality, it's hard. I believe in the mind, body, and soul. Mm-hmm. I believe you become what you feed your body. Um, and I do believe that your body is a temple. And if you destroy it, you're just, you're destroying yourself. You know, you want to build yourself and be strong and be as healthy as possible. So I, I try to stay as healthy as possible. I do believe in um, meditation. I think healing your mind and clearing your mind is so important as far as God or relig- or specific religion goes. I, I have to be honest it's very hard for me and I don't feel I have faith in God or in any form of religion at this point in my life. Um, And then as far as my parents go, the relationship just has been so damaged that when we now are around each other or the once or twice a year that we speak on the phone, it just seems so fake to me. And so the relationship really isn't, it doesn't really exist to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, But at this point in my life right now, I'm kind of okay with that. I'm kind of okay with not having that relationship because I do know that if we began to have more discussions together, um, it would be a, a lot more fighting. And I think it would do more damage to me um, than help me with my healing process. I think you're doing exactly what you need to do right now. I, I think it's wonderful and actually really courageous of you to recognize that and to hold that boundary. And the reason I say that is because when you have a relationship with people that you love and there is a lack of boundaries when you've been, when you feel that you've been betrayed and when you experience extreme trauma, you know, indirectly as a result of that, of those relationships, I think that, or I have found from my personal experience has been that when I interact with those people, anger and resentment well up to the surface. And it doesn't matter until you heal those core wounds within yourself, whenever you have those interactions with them, I have found that it doesn't matter how good their intentions are. It doesn't matter how much they love you. It doesn't matter if they're trying to change it in your head or like for me, in my head, in those instances, I've looked at them and been like, no matter what you do right now, it's not going to be enough because I still haven't forgiven you and I still haven't forgiven myself and I need to work on that before I can enter back into this relationship and honestly create a new foundation. And so I think that, I think that what you're doing is courageous and smart and so healthy that you've been able to recognize and that you're not allowing yourself to be forced into a relationship that, um, that ultimately would be destructive to your well being at this point. So bravo. (laughs) Thank you. You know, um, relating this to COVID and what Mm -hmm. we're going through. Um, I, so I have a very close relationship with my sisters. Um, We speak very often. It's my Mm -hmm. parents that there's not really a relationship there, but I can't blame my sisters for something that 
they didn't have any control of. But we've had a very strong bond and a relationship, and we've been able to talk about these issues and um, kind of explain to them where that how I am and who I am isn't bad and that I'm trying to do good. Because the thing is, is that what my parents taught us is that basically if you're gay or lesbian or transgender, for some reason, a lot of people believe that somehow that is a hundred times worse than being a drug addict or whatever the case be. And so I was constantly treated less than every single human being in my family because of my sexuality. Um, But like I said, going back to COVID, the relationship between me and my sisters has kind of become a little distant right now because they're living in a state like Texas that is extremely conservative. And I live in a state like Massachusetts, which is completely liberal. Um, And the responses to COVID have been completely different. And the reason is it's be- it's become more of a political issue than it has a pandemic or the science. A lot of people down South believe that this is fake, that this is not real. Um, and I'm living in a city where this is very real. You know, we're seeing hundreds of thousands of people die from this virus. Um, so it kind of formed this line between me and my sisters. And I made that decision to close off the relationship until things get a little more settled with COVID, um, mostly because I didn't, I didn't want to see them end up being hurt in some form of way from COVID. Mm-hmm. And here I am telling them, like, this is very serious. This is very real. And I felt like they weren't listening to me. And I felt it doing more damage to me mentally than helping them or helping myself. And so that's when I decided I'm going to cut you off for a little bit. And I'm going to do my thing. And I'm going to let you do your thing. And then at the end of it, we can come together and we can realize where we were wrong or where we were right, and we can figure it out then. But in the moment, I said to myself mentally, I cannot continue to fight with you if you're not even going to listen to me and understand where I'm coming from. And that is another example of how I've learned through my experiences and how I'm continuing to learn and grow um, and how it's affecting me and helping me decide what's healthy and what's not healthy for my, my mental health. Um, and so it's exactly the same thing with my parents and religion. I cannot continue to have conversations that they're not going to hear my side and be understanding. And instead they're going to constantly make me feel like I am a problem. And so I've made that decision for a long time that I'm okay with how things are and I'm going to continue things the way they are because I'm, I'm okay right now. And I feel okay right now. And I don't want to, I don't want to get into a really bad place to where mentally I feel like I can't get out of it. Right. No, I totally, I can totally relate to that. And again, I mean, that just, that tells me how far you've come since, um, since you left the world of sex trafficking and sex work, um, because those boundaries, you know, those, uh, we don't even have those boundaries. At least I didn't going into the streets and, you know, what was that like for you? I mean, when did you, when did you start to realize that you had a voice and when did you start to realize that you had the power to make different choices while you were being trafficked? You know, it, after being trafficked, After getting out of the relationship with Cody, the 36-year-old, I hit a really, really tough place. I was in a very hard place, um, very dark. Mm -hmm. I began partying constantly. I used alcohol as an outlet for me. Um, It was very unhealthy 
the life that I was living. I didn't care about anybody. I didn't care about myself. I felt disgusting. I felt worthless. I felt like I was never going to be anyone. Mm -hmm. And I was always going to continue to be nobody. And that is completely different than the person that I was before the 36 year old, before the trafficking. I had goals. I had dreams. I had, I wanted to be on Broadway. I wanted to live in New York city. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to go to a university. I wanted to be that child in my family where people looked up to me and respected me and said, I am so proud of you. Um, and I, I hit a place to where I no longer cared. I no longer cared. And this, this is a part where I always get emotional because it's, it's a, it's a shitty feeling to feel that way, to feel like, you can't come out of it and you're never going to be the person that you want it to be because everyone gave up on you. Mm. Everyone told you that you're wrong and something is wrong with you and you need to be fixed and you need to change. And that just changed the whole idea for me that I was ever going to be anything or anyone. And with that, I, with losing hope, it wasn't until I had a friend come and visit me in 2014. He came from Houston. He came to Boston and he said to me, Jose, I need to tell you that I understand. And I know what you went through at the eight when you were a teenager. And he said, and you need to go online and you need to look up Jason Gandy because he got arrested in 2012 for doing the same thing to a 15 year old boy that he did to you. The only difference is, is that he took this boy, 15 year old boy across the border and tried to take him to the Olympics um, <laughs> and was going to sex traffic him in London. Um, and like I said, do the exact same thing that he did to me, to this 15 year old boy. And it's in that moment that I was disgusted with myself because I questioned why didn't I do and why didn't I ever say anything? And of course, now I know, now I understand why I didn't, um, the fear of coming forward and sharing and thinking that I was going to be the one in trouble. Um, but I did have that moment where I was just like, I could have done something and I could have stopped this man from doing this to so many other boys. Um, but it wasn't until we went to trial in 2018 and people were listening to me as I testified against him and they sympath or empathized with me and they felt bad for me and they showed me emotion and told me what you went through, Jose was not your fault and it was wrong. And it was in that moment where I felt validated and I felt like I could set myself free um, and I can begin, and I'm sorry, I don't want to um, get emotional, but I can begin a journey of healing and I can become the person that I always wanted to be. And I don't need anyone anymore. I have set up myself for success. I have set myself up for a future and I have myself now and I can continue to grow and become the person that I always wanted to be. And Hey, here I am and I'm doing it and I'm living it. And, um, it, it's exciting. It's very, very exciting, but it was in that moment where things started to take a turn for me. And I am so grateful um, that Jason was arrested and he's now serving a 30 year sentence in prison. That's incredible. I mean, it's, it's very rare um, that you hear about the traffickers getting busted and then, you know, actually having to be accountable for the role that they played in dismantling children's lives, you know, and, um, I don't know. I, I have I have a lot of feelings about traffickers, and the, and they're mixed because I do believe 
and, and this is a controversial topic, subject, and definitely an opinion, which is that I think that everybody is looking towards healing themselves. And I, and I don't think human trafficking is going to come to an end until everybody accepts responsibility for their actions and then works towards healing themselves and figuring out what drove them to pursue um, their, you know, the hurting of other people and what, you know, into that survival mode. Right. And, um, it's really, you know, hearing that he is having to spend time and, uh, pay for, not pay for those mistakes, because I believe that correction is, is more important than punishment. Um, but you know, he's, he's being forced into a situation where he has to correct his behavior and where he's serving as an example for other people that are going down his path as per pimping or sex trafficking other people. What does that make you feel like? Like when you think about him now and you think about, you know, the role that he played in getting you to where you are, what are your feelings surrounding that? Like, where are you at now? And and what are, what are you working towards? Like, how do you hope to feel about this in the end? Um, so I've forgiven him and Mm -hmm. I think I forgave him a long time ago. Um, but I also want you to know that the time that I spent with him, which was about three months that I, it was a summer that I spent with him. I never, I didn't fall in love with him. I didn't, I didn't ever allow myself to get as close to him as other victims did. And I say this because there were three others that came forward and I've met them and I've talked with them, but I never allowed myself to get close to him. And I think the reason is, is because I was so close to Cody, the 36 year old. um, And that was what I was aiming for. That was what I wanted. I wanted him. I wanted a relationship with him and I wanted that to be normal. Um, but I never allowed myself to get close to him. And I think because of that, it was a little easier for me to forgive him. Um, I also think that because I have spent a very large portion of my life living through trauma, that it was easier for me to forgive him because there were so many other people that I was looking at as the reason why I went through what I went through. Um, My parents were the hardest to forgive um, because I do believe that if they had just been there for me and had, had loved me unconditionally, maybe none of this would have happened to me. Um, But again, I don't blame them for everything that happened to me. um, But I do, I did forgive him a long time ago. And I think that's made it easier. Even going to trial, people, the biggest question that I get is what was it like seeing him after years of, of not seeing him? And it wasn't hard for me. If anything, I wanted to laugh in his face because he looked ridiculous. I mean, I'm a hairstylist, so I work in the beauty industry. This, this, <laughs> guy, this guy had a chili bowl haircut and it was parted (laughs) down the middle and I just remember looking at him and just being like wow like dude like you look awful like Mm -hmm. you could have tried to make yourself look normal in some kind of way um but I just remember thinking like you look hideous um and I really had no feelings towards him if anything the part where I got emotional during the trial was seeing myself at the age of 16 um, Mm -hmm. when they put a picture up of myself. um, And that moment hit me really hard because it was like seeing myself at that age um, and putting myself back in that place. Mm -hmm. That was hard for me. It had nothing to do with what people did to me. It was remembering the feeling and what I was feeling during those times, that feeling of no hope, that feeling of, you know, I'm never going to, I'm never going to have the love and respect that I've been searching for. 
Mm-hmm. And to just put myself back in that place, that was a struggle for me. But I didn't blame anyone. It was just more of like, oh, that was such a hard time in my life. And I hated myself. And and then I see this picture of myself smiling at the age of 16. And it broke me. It broke me and tore me to pieces. And um, that was hard for me. Not Jason, not my parents, not Cody. It was just the hardship that I had gone through the the struggle and how horrible and hard it was for me. That was the hard part facing myself and seeing that I didn't live the life that I thought I was going to live. Um, and I, in a way I hated myself more than I hated everyone else. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the scariest parts about coming forward, at least Uh, For me, one of the scariest parts about coming forward was being fearful that when you come out with this story that people, when people find out the ways in which you chose to survive, are they going to love you? And, and I mean like a romantic partnership or, you know, like not friendship wise, because my friends. I, th- I think that there's, um, you know, friends can, can view you differently. But when you come out with your story, you step out into the spotlight. And then I realized that that fear of not, you know, ever being able to ha- to be in a romantic relationship with someone who knew the truth about, you know, my experiences and what I did in my survival story. Um, it really actually showed me that I hadn't accepted in, in all ways. Like I had accepted responsibility for it, but that my fear that was sitting there that that told me that there were still some things I had to work on for myself, you know? And so because I recognized that I chose to um, become celibate and to really do and invest in myself and, and get to the, that self love and that self care and, you know, knowing, believing and acting upon it. How's that been for you? How, how has, you know, how relationships been for you since then? How have, you know, in what ways are you doing to get to that sweet spot of that self-love and the value? It's hard. It's right. Re- <laughs> okay, good. I'm not the only one. <laughs> it is really hard. And to be honest with you, um, congratulations for becoming celibate because, because I have been so sexual since obviously since the age of four, mm-hmm. you know, I continue to be sexual and I have tried to take a step back and realize that not everyone lived a life like I did. Not everyone went through what I went through. And it's not as normal to constantly be as sexual or think sexually constantly. And I've gone through a lot of relationships where I have compared them to past relationships. And the number one relationship that I had been in for the longest time was with the 36 year old. And that was solely based on sex. And so from then on, I believed that a healthy and normal relationship was very similar to the life that I was living with Cody. Mm -hmm. And that has really tarnished my views on a healthy relationship. So that's still a work in progress. I have been in a relationship for eight years now. Oh, Um, wow. Yes. And he's, he treats me with respect. He loves me. He cares about me. He builds me up when I'm down. He's there for me. He supports me. But I've come to learn that a lot of our problems are stemming from my past. Mm -hmm. And I'm creating those problems because of my PTSD, my anxiety, you know, anytime a situation comes up, I compare it to my past and then boom, I'm in a really bad place. And now I start thinking negatively of him. Um, But I think it's important that as we continue to heal, we also recognize that because we're healing and because we're in a safe place, we need to realize that not everything is what it used to be. Not everything is bad. Not everything is out to get you. Not everything is out to ruin your life. And I've had to realize that, that the person that I have and the person that I'm with is a great person. And I need to value that. And I need to respect that because if I continue to compare it to my past, 
it's not going to go well. And it's probably going to destroy a relationship that is so good for me. No, I completely, completely understand that. And I, and I think too, that there's, um, when you enter into a relationship, like what you're describing, and I had a similar one to that, it's, there's that feeling of safety that's there. And, and you're actually in a, you're in a better place to address the PTSD and to address the trauma because you know that you're in a safe place where when these things come up, when you have that level of trust there, that you can talk about it with them and that they're not going to, you know, jump to conclusions or they'll, they'll just understand a little bit better. Like, Oh, you know, they're having a bad day today. Something's triggered them, something set them off, you know, and they, they can give you enough space to try to work through that or maybe not take things as personally as say just an innocent bystander would, you know, when you're, when you're going through the actions of being in a reactive state. So I think that's really wonderful. What, what are some of the PTSD symptoms that you carried with you? Um, to be honest with you, it, it took a long time for me to pinpoint and recognize what PTSD even was. Mm-hmm. I know it stands for post-traumatic stress disorder, but how do I pinpoint it in my life and say, this is an episode? This is PTSD. For a long time, I was like, okay, they say I have PTSD, but I don't know what the hell that is. Or I don't know when I've shown that I have PTSD. Um, But it's, I can specifically name a time, um, and it was shortly after the trial. And I came home and I had set myself up for two full work schedules, 12 hours each day. And to catch up for the week that I had missed and to get with my clients. And I told this story of the trafficking and the trial, I have to say, more times in two days than I have ever told my entire life. That's what it felt like. And it's repeating this and repeating it and repeating it. And I come home and I just out of nowhere had this outer body experience where I'm screaming at David. Mm -hmm. I don't even know. David is my partner now of eight years. Um, But I'm screaming at him at the top of my lungs and he is totally just caught off guard. He's like, what is going on? Like, I have no idea what he did, what he, what I did to him. I have no idea why he's upset, upset with me, but I am going ballistic. And I'm crying and I'm screaming and I'm telling him, you're nobody. You've never gone through, not even remotely close to the things that I've gone through. You'll never understand. And I'm telling him, I hate you. I hate everyone in my life. I wish I was dead. I no longer want to be here anymore. And I remember not even being able to control any of the feelings that I was feeling, the anger, the sadness, the darkness, I could not get out of it and I could not control it. And it was just like I was 16, 15, all over again. And I'm screaming at Cody. I'm screaming at Jason. I'm screaming at my parents. And that was a moment where I knew PTSD had taken over And there was no way that I was coming out of it. And I needed to be left alone. And that's what David did for me. He left me alone. I went to sleep and I woke up feeling like a different person. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's those moments, those big moments where you have no control over it. um, That's when I started to recognize, okay, something's wrong with you, buddy. (laughs) It's time. It's time to get some help. It's time to figure this out and figure out ways that you can control it. And to be honest with you, the ways that I've figured out to control it or to help, and again, it's still a work in progress, but Mm -hmm. I try to stay away from alcohol when I know I'm having a really hard time. Mm -hmm. I try to stay away from conversations that I know are going to end up in an argument or going to leave me feeling empty or leave me in a dark place. Um, I try to focus on my mental health. I try to exercise more. I try to, um, clear my mind and remind myself that you are in a great place in life so that I don't have an episode. Um, I will tell you that 
anxiety and, um, what is it? Um, well, I will say like my anxiety was really bad for years and years and years. I mean, I was bedridden for about two weeks where I didn't, I barely ate. I would not get out of bed. And it wasn't until I chewed both sides of my tongue and I woke up with a mouthful of blood that I was like, I need to go to the hospital. I need to see a doctor. And they put me on medication. But that feeling of that feeling like my heart was beating out of my chest, like my fingertips were going numb. I felt like I was going to black out and pass out or vomit and feeling like I was going to die, that I knew something is really, really wrong with me. That was probably one of the scariest moments um, that I've had in my life. Um, And I've now learned how to control that and how to keep myself from having another episode of anxiety or PTSD because of those moments. Um, But I've realized that drugs and alcohol really um, create more of the anxiety and PTSD. Yes, they'll help a little bit in the moment, but it's after where you're left feeling down. And that's what it does. It's a downer. Mm Mm-hmm. No, for sure. I, um, I agree with you. Like the self-medication, you know, takes place, but then there's, I called it the hangover, like the dope hangover afterwards. And, you know, you're taking the drugs in order to get through the worst of the symptoms. But then when you come to, then you're dealing with a whole second set of problems that, you know, that are con- contributed to by the, by the drugs and the alcohol. And, um, I've been sober, for, from drugs, uh, I think for like 15 or more years. Um, the last time I did drugs was recreationally, like back in maybe I think that was 22 or something, 21, 22. So I absolutely agree. You know, it's, it's important to find other ways, other outlets, um, that help keep you motivated and engaged and with a part of your body, because Usually, at least for me, during PTSD or anxiety or triggers, which I'm so blessed that I've done so much work, I don't have them like I used to. Um, you know, I find that being that they send you out of body, and then you're just really disconnected. You're it's just it's a disassociation from yourself and from whatever's going on around you, and that that's why it's so important to have for like what you said, you have your fitness and your self care. Um, it's important to have those in place because they do keep you tethered to this reality. And so it's harder to get lost in the depression and it's harder to get lost in those toxic negative belief systems that you are working so hard to overcome. Um, You know, when it comes to triggers, when you're in the middle of having them, I think it's, you don't even know it. You have no idea. You just know that you're responding to an anxiety and you're in a reactive state. And so you partake in a series of, you know, perhaps escalating actions to make yourself feel safe again. And I didn't know that that's what PTSD was personally. And and I had lots of quirks. Um, and I was, you know, I was in relationships with boyfriends, long-term boyfriends, and I had no idea that I was exhibiting full on symptoms of somebody that should have been on antidepressants or somebody that should have been seeking a therapist. Um, what was that like for you? Like, did you recognize in sexual instances where anxiety was coming up for you or were you able, I don't know if there's a difference between men and women like that. You know, I, I honestly, I don't. So I would be curious, is there a difference there? Did you, did you have the same similar troubles, uh, becoming involved in certain sexual behaviors or acts with your partner? Um, I did not see it in sexual, um, I didn't see it in any form or any way or shape or form through sexual um, issues. Mm -hmm. And I don't want, I also don't want to um, be correlated between male and female because I think everyone's mind is a little different. And Mm -hmm. um, I think that there could be some males who feel the same way that you do. Um, But for me, it was, more so the relationship that I had with Cody, um, that I realized I had episodes with my anxiety, um, when I first met David 
And I didn't know if I could fully trust him. If his phone went off in the middle of the night, I would think to myself, he must be cheating on me. And that second that I put that thought into my head, my heart would race to the point where I couldn't even breathe and I couldn't control it. And I couldn't calm myself down until I confronted the situation. But if I confront the situation, am I going to create a larger problem within my relationship? And so then I would keep myself from questioning because I didn't want to tarnish my relationship. And instead I'm left with this anxiety and this feeling like I'm going to die constantly for days, for weeks until I have an explosion. Mm. And that is probably the effects that I have of my traumas. It would be more so from a relationship standpoint versus sexual, um, my sexual relationship with my partner. Mm. The fear of them cheating. Do you think that that stemmed from, you know, the lack of trust or not feeling like you were good enough, or was it the possibility that there was lies and, um, you know, just deviations within the, like within the one-on-one relationship? I would say all of the above, but mostly, um, mostly because I felt like I wasn't good enough. Mm. And I, and I say that because if you look at everything that I've gone through, I wasn't good enough for my parents. Mm -hmm. I wasn't good enough for Cody. I wasn't enough for Cody period. You know, he was constantly looking for something else, something better. Um, I wasn't good enough for Jason. Um, And so when you're constantly feeling like, I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to be this person. You then enter each relationship and it becomes the same thing. Am I good enough? Is this going to be like every other relationship? And you start to think, yes, it's going to be just like the relationship with Cody or Jason. It's Mm -hmm. going to turn out that way. And I will say it's the strangest thing, but there's a part of me that almost wanted the arguments, that mm-hmm. wanted the chaos in my life to happen all over again. Because well, it's that normal is, to you. That, exactly. That mm-hmm. is normal to me. And that is the world that I'm used to. And then I meet someone like David, who everything has been so great for him, you know? And I don't mean that to diminish any problems that he's had or gone through or minimize them. But I mean that in a way that, you know, he went to college, he went to a university, he's a doctor, he's successful, he had the the support of his parents, and they've been there for him, and they continue to be there for him. And he is, he's, he hasn't really seen trauma. And when you enter a relationship with someone like that, it can either go great, and it can be successful, or it can be really bad. And we've had our ups and downs. And I know that a lot of it, a lot of our downs have stemmed from, again, my past. Um, So I've, I've really learned to understand that he might not be understanding of what I went through and he might not fully get it. And I have to respect that. And I have to try to control how I'm acting and how I'm being and how and what I push on him. You know, if, if I have these sexual feelings, like I constantly need to be sexual, what am I doing to him? How am I hurting him in his mental state by making him feel like he needs to be sexual when maybe that's just not the person that he is. And I've had to step back and try to realize, you know, that we're different And he hasn't really seen everything that I've gone through. And I need to be a little more understanding of that. I hope that answered. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Like, do you think that you used sex as a way to make sure the relationship was still okay? And, you know, and then, or was it more of a, um, I'm going to make this thing okay by making sure that they're getting all the sex that they need. I know like for myself and some of my friends that that's come up 
as part of, you know, our behavioral conditioning and patterning, which in like to say that, you know, in the past to make sure that everything was okay with the relationship, I would engage in sex, not because I was particularly feeling it, but because I wanted to make sure that they were still connected to what was going on. Do you think that that plays a part in it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I watched my mother um, become the servant to my father. Mm -hmm. I I then became a servant sexually to Cody, the 36-year-old. I then Mm -hmm. became literally a sex slave to Jason and his clients. I then became, you know, going through the survival sex that I went through. By the way, I still consider that prostitution. I still call it prostitution. Um, But I've been told the formal way of the formal name is survival sex. But um, even going through that, I then began to think that the way to keep my relationship going Mm -hmm. And to make sure that we're good is by being this sexual servant to him. And the relationship that I have now and David, that he's, he's not like that. Like he's not looking for that. He truly wants a relationship with me and just wants the love and the support. And, and of course we have sexual moments, like any healthy relationship, but it's not, like I need to, or I have to, but for a long time, I did feel like, okay, if, if I'm not constantly having sex with him, then he must be getting sex from somewhere else. But that's not the case. Mm -hmm. He's not having sex with anyone. He's just, he just doesn't need sex that much, you know? Um, Well, I think it's not even that they don't need sex that much. I think that, you know, for people that have experienced sexual trauma, it becomes a part of our tool belts and it becomes a part of how we cope with our trauma and it becomes a part of how we interact with other people because that's what we've been taught to do. But I think that, you know, the safer that you become in your relationship and the deeper that the friendship becomes within uh, the relationships, the more tools we add to our belt. And it's hard to change our thought patterns from, you know, oh, they're upset with me. I need to have sex with them so that that, because that'll make everything better. And we actually learn to be more comfortable within our discomfort and go, wow, this conversation or their actions here made me feel or has me feeling X, Y, and Z, but this is something that I, I don't need to fix this with sex. This is something that I can sit back and I need to process my, my emotions and I need to feel these feelings. And then when I can come at this from a healthy perspective, then I need to sit down and have the conversation and share what I'm thinking with my partner versus being like, uh, yeah, let's just uh, public place. That's cool. Let's find a bathroom. Let's fix this now. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I, it's still a struggle for me. It's still yeah. trying to figure out um, when and where and how and what to mm-hmm. do in those moments where we have a disagreement, you know, I have slowly started to learn that sex isn't always the answer. Um, Mm -hmm. but I'm still, again, it's a process. I'm still figuring it out for sure. Oh, absolutely. And, and again, like I stress it, it gets, it does get easier. It does become better. I remember, um, my partner that I had, uh, previously he passed away, but it was the first time I think that I didn't jump into the relationship with sex, using it as sex, that actually that person became the the safe zone. I felt safe next to them. And that was really mind boggling for me because I was like, whoa, this is a strange feeling. Um, I I have the space and the time to process what I'm thinking and feeling. I don't have to, you know, step in and, and try to hang on to this thing. But I also think that that comes with that level of self value. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know, are you able to look back now or do you look back now or do you hope to look back at the people that, you know, contributed to your lack of self value? Are you, are you able to look at them now and realize, oh, it's not that I was never enough for them. It's that I wasn't enough for me and they weren't enough for themselves and are too our two personalities or our two, you know, needs, um, collided and was just, you know, an absolute just chaos, chaotic event 
you know, in which you were both see searching through the other person, trying to find that self-validation when, um, and so of course you can never be enough for them. You can never be, because you were never enough for yourself to begin with. Like, is that, and do you think things like that, or I don't know. Absolutely. (laughs) I mean, but I, I I kind of understand where you're, what you're saying. I feel like I look back at some of those relationships and of course I do recognize that it wasn't necessarily them or me. Um, but I try to put myself in both places Mm -hmm. and try to understand and try to analyze it and figure out, okay, where did it go wrong? What happened here? And to be honest with you, I wish I knew what I knew now. I wish I knew then what I know now within those relationships. And I actually think that if I did recognize that what I had gone through was wrong or that the way that I um, used sex as an answer to my problems, maybe the relationships would have worked. Maybe things would have turned out differently. Um, But at the same time, I, I can't really fully say that that was necessarily the issue. Um, but I think there's a time and place for everything. And I think that right now and this moment and this time in my life, I've recognized a lot of that and my relationship now, I can now analyze it and say, okay, Jose, you know what you went through. You know what it's done to you. You know what how you've handled things in the past and it's now time to change it try a different, a different way, a different tactic to, um, fix whatever issue that it is that I'm going through. And that has helped me tremendously, especially when I'm having an argument with David today. Um, so it's all about learning and growing from our past experiences for sure. Oh, I think that's beautiful. Um, so what would you say to our listeners today like what are some actionable steps that have helped you to get to where you're at that they might be able to implement or apply to their own life experiences right now? It's simple and it's easy. Not really. Um, (laughs) not really. Um, love yourself, learn to love yourself. And that has so many meanings and there's so many different ways to achieve that, but whatever it is and whatever you need to do to love yourself, whether it's staying single, staying sober, staying celibate, whatever it is, learn to love yourself and try different ways. Find out what makes you happy, what makes you feel good, whether it's exercise or meditation or a a hobby of some sort, figure out what makes you happy so that you can start to love yourself and be happy with yourself. I think that is what has helped me the most is recognizing that I don't need to be for everyone else. I need to be for myself and I need to learn to love myself so that I can learn to love others properly. No, it's really beautiful. And what are some things that you would um, suggest if they're, if they're feeling anxious or if they're feeling, um, you know, stuck or like they're going to make some bad decisions and they know that they're going to actively engage in that? What are some things that you would suggest for them to, to help th- them through that? Take a deep breath. And if you need to remove yourself and walk away, remove yourself and walk away. I find that it's in situations you are so much stronger walking away than sitting there and thinking or doing whatever it is that you're contemplating. Um, Just walk away. You're a bigger and better person when you walk away from any situation that's going to cause some form of harm or it's going to ruin something in your life. I say walk away, take a deep breath and think about what's about to happen and picture yourself after that situation, what's going to happen? What's it going to be like for you? Um, I think it's important that we take a step back at, at any decision that we're making, whether it be what we're eating, 
um, for dinner. You know, I, if I eat pasta or fast food right before bed, I know tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up and I'm going to feel like shit. So I make that decision. I take a step back and I say, you know what, Jose, maybe tonight you should have some grilled chicken breasts and maybe some vegetables so that tomorrow you feel awesome. And I'm not saying that it's not okay to every now and then indulge in bad food or um, alcohol or whatever it be, but try to think about how you're going to feel after you make that decision for yourself. No, I think that's beautiful. And if, if somebody wanted to reach out because they have experienced something similar to yourself or they are going through something which you've described and they feel the need for a mentor, where can they reach you at? Um, they can either email me at Jose, J O S E Alfaro, A L F A R O. 415 at iCloud.com, or they could even follow me on Instagram, Jose Lewis Alfaro. L E W I S is Lewis. Um, again, Alfaro, A L F A R O on Instagram, and send me a DM. And I, I'm more than happy to talk with you, help you through whatever it is that you're struggling with. Um, and hopefully, I can be some form of help or even just someone that can listen to whatever it is that you're going through. Oh, that's really beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to talk with us, um, you know, and to share your story and uh, to just, you know, just for everything. Thank you for everything. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Okay. uh, I guess we're going to end the podcast there today and uh, hopefully we look, you know, hopefully we can reconnect and uh, bring you back on the podcast uh, again soon. Absolutely. Let me know when, and I am totally down for it. Ah, Amazing. Okay. Well, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. We appreciate it so much. And uh, we will have in the show notes, all of the contact information for Jose. If you'd like to reach out, even just to tell him that uh, if, if his story touched you in some way. So uh, I guess that's it. Thank you so much. Bye. Disclaimer, this podcast is for informational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions or viewpoints of the host, producer, other guests, or sponsors. I, Rayanne K. Irving, am not, nor have I ever been, a doctor or therapist, and none of what I say is intended for professional or medical advice.